co-founders of the Augmented Reality Developer Camp, so it's funny to have him up. And if our third presenter, uh, Lyndon Nixon, is in the room, feel free to go ahead and come on up. And it looks like we're ready to go in the back, so uh, whenever you find your source for us. <laughs> This has been the running gag of the room all day, you know, so uh, I hope you don't have to unplug this thing. Like That's entirely possible. Okay. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hope everybody's doing well today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about extended senses and invisible fences. Uh, but I want to start with a quote from Manu Fernandez. Hello, Manu, where are you? Pardon me. The intelligence of the city is on the streets. Uh, and I think this is an important distinction that uh, really reminds us that humanity is at the center of uh, the discussions around intelligent cities. The, the humanity really creates our cities. Uh, and this offers a counterpoint to the productized packages of technological salvation that are really common in the marketplace today. Um, so maybe keep this in mind as I present what is kind of a tech-heavy picture of the city. Uh, so I'd like to start by setting the frame for this scenario. Uh, and this is really informed by my own experiences of primarily Western cities. Uh, the world may unfold very differently in Lagos or Khartoum, uh, so bear that in mind. Uh, computation is a fundamental driver for human innovation and adaptation. Ubicomp is a deep current, uh, but nature is a deeper current. Uh, and I would, in fact, argue that computation is leading us back to biosystems. Uh, there are innumerable innovations emerging uh, from every corner across all sorts of scales. Uh, the outcome is going to be a patchwork, not necessarily any sort of uniform solution. Uh, and there is a tension between technology and humanity. We're not entirely at ease with our innovations. Uh, the pace of technology is so fast uh, that it often outpaces our ability to understand its consequences. Uh, and this is especially so as we yield more and more of our agency to uh, machines and algorithms. Uh, governance contains and innovation uh, releases. This is kind of a fundamental dialectic of creation, this sort of order and chaos. Uh, and, and there are both positive and negative outcomes from this dialectic. Uh, we command our tools. We created them, we gave them life, uh, but increasingly we are allowing them to command us. Uh, and this is kind of the, uh, the trade-off we find ourselves negotiating here at the dawn of the 21st century. Uh, so if the frame is one of kind of excitement uh, as well as attention, uh, I'd like to explore some of the assumptions that are carrying this particular scenario forward. So global GDP slowly grows. Uh, more so in Africa and Asia, but funded and driven by the West. Uh, cities continue to add population. We see both optimizations and degradations, uh, sort of boom time build-outs, uh, as well as downturn data decay. Uh, we avoid the energy crash through a mixture of uh, old and new inputs, uh, but there are many bumps along the way, especially as the uh, resource needs of the developing world start to dominate the global stage. Uh, economic structures are evolutionary, not revolutionary. Things will change, but not radically in the near term, uh, although capital will continue its steady redistribution into younger markets that are trying to capture the prosperity of the West. Uh, we're not really able to understand and manage high-level systems, particularly natural systems. They're just extremely complex. Uh, and as a species at this scale, we're, we're, we're better at adapting than we are at designing and managing them. Uh, governance will increasingly balkanize. Uh, the sort of top-level authority will be more and more distracted, uh, contending with multinational corporations, NGOs, syndicates, uh, and super-empowered individuals. Uh, but this type of distraction sort of opens up a lot of tremendous gaps for innovation, uh, both positive and negative. Uh, Small-town mayors and local tech collectives may be uh, as likely as gun traffickers and drug cartels to drive regional innovation. 
Uh, the lady, living city, I would argue, is emergent. Uh, you can't just design and engineer great cities from scratch. Uh, they emerge organically and grow by the will of their inhabitants. So it's assumed that cities are highly resilient uh, and that they resist extraordinary change even in the face of great discontinuities. Uh, and so the urban landscape will continue to evolve mostly as it has, uh, although notably it will, it will increasingly extrude a very rich skin of connected technologies. Uh, and that's really what the focus of this talk is. So given these assumptions, uh, I'd like to explore six domains uh, through which we engage the city. Uh, and, and along the way, sort of define a loose taxonomy uh, of uh, mediated interactions we have with the urban computational scaffolding. Uh, the personal domain. Uh, it's, it's about the individual as a reference point uh, and the types of experiences that uh, arrange around us. Our network identification begins with our connected devices. We all effectively kind of have an internet address in a sense. Uh, and our network ID authenticates and provisions us with access or bars us from admittance. Uh, the clothes we wear, the devices we carry, they're all coming online and starting to communicate and will be cataloged as part of our personal mesh. Our identity is wrapped in and contextualized by our location. Uh, location confers spatial intelligence and it evokes situated technologies around us. Our data profile contains our personal information, memberships, affinities, uh, history, networks, paths. Uh, this is our digital identity linked to our network identification. It's the, the sort of core information structure around which the urban interface assembles for us. Uh, and this is really how we are clothing ourselves in sensitive technologies. Excuse me. So surrounding the personal domain is the local sphere, the kind of relationships that we have with our surroundings. Uh, from identity and location, we can derive proximity. Uh, what are we near? Can we interact with it in some way? Is it interested in us? Uh, does it have something hidden to reveal? Proximity reaches out to ambient information. Uh, our movements through the city uh, contain information valuable to us and to others. Where have we been? What is our trajectory? Are there path optimizations available? How can we meet and assemble uh, and disperse and perhaps evade? Uh, everybody's talking about context, context but <clears throat> Gradually, context is just going to be the way things sort of happen around us. Uh, identity and proximity enable context awareness and situated technologies. Uh, and around context, you can assemble a host of uh, services and solutions. Boundaries, zones, perimeters, uh, an always-on network ID that understands identity, proximity, and context uh, can provision or revoke services based on our location. Uh, Geofrencing. Geofencing is a friendly welcome, uh, a local game world, or possibly an ankle bracelet under house arrest. Uh, in the local domain, we have extended senses and invisible fences. Uh, and in this way, we are anchoring the virtual in the actual and wiring the real to the transreal. So from the local domain comes a broader context, uh, the sort of structural domain. Uh, this is defined by a rapid mapping and instrumentation of the built environment uh, through construction and retrofit, uh, uh, modeling and reality capture, plumbing sensors, computation, network connectivity into the world around us. This is sort of the IBM brochure of the smart city. Uh, architecture is sort of the most embo obvious embodiment of the built environment. Uh, and, and with CAD and building information management and real-time dashboards, uh, we see the sort of runtime mirror of living architecture, uh, mapping infrastructure, heat envelopes, and human activity. Uh, energy, security, water, waste, heating, roadways, rail, inflows, outflows, uh, all this stuff is sort of coming online and starting to communicate uh, and, and even correcting itself. Um, and so, you know, one of the things to consider is that we're going to need new data instruments in order to uh, interface with and comprehend this huge volume of urban informatics. A transport is the blood flow of the city. Instrumentation promises great efficiencies in scheduling, wayfinding, flow optimization, and tracking of goods. 
but it will also create increased automation, remote management and control, uh, and potentially entirely new system punks for disruptors to attack. Uh, ubiquitous wireless coverage, uh, unavoidable instrumentation, a civic nervous system wired by fiber to the global brain, ambient messaging, continuous status, non-local task assignment, frictionless communication, uh, mobile mesh networks and distributed computation, all the sort of fun things that are possible. Uh, in a sense, we're all going to be uh, mechanical Turks in rented clusters as people assign tasks to our local <coughs> computation meshes. Uh, and in this way, we're creating a computational sensorium of urban informatics within our relationship with the city. Uh, I was going to do an entire talk based on this slide. This is augmented reality right here. This is the enterprise uh, pathway. Uh, AR is really just an interface layer, and, and I'd tell you that this is where the money is. <clears throat> uh, so interaction is implicit in all the previous domains. Uh, but what are some of the parameters for access and interface? Uh, visual interface is the most common to the discussion of augmented reality, uh, as well as to fears of occlusion and relentless billboarding by marketers. Uh, but what of tags and annotations, uh, memorials and territories, visible avatars and secret locations? How will the shared construct of reality be forced to shift when what I see may be very different from what each of you sees. Uh, the city is talking to us, personal, contextual, uh, instructive, artistically, a poem embedded in a bench spoken by an ancestor as we walk past. Force feedback, haptic vibrosuits, handprint biometrics and sensing surfaces, uh, how might haptics be adopted in personal, social, and, and public contexts? Uh, a visible language of form and movement, seen by machine eyes and relayed to networks, actuators, and servo arrays. This is also gait analysis and uh, physioskeletal profiling. Verbal commands to digital ears, occult communications, talk to your device, talk to the walls, speak friend and pass. These are ways we interface with the awakening world. Our nature is social, relationships are interactive and transactional, uh, and we build technologies to enable new sorts of relationships. Uh, however, sometimes we are forced into relationships. Uh, at its core, cybernetics uh, is a means to control information systems. The combination of ubiquitous computation and network connectivity is by design a control system. Um, regulation in the living city is a good thing and a bad thing. Control is both optimization and oppression, depending on the circumstances. Connected identification, proximity and location knowledge, remote access to embedded systems and ubiquitous surveillance. Uh, these enable an array of solutions to interested third parties. I like this quote for the sense of moral ambiguity it brings into the UbiComp conversation. Uh, context remind people and their devices how to behave. And this is important to consider as we bond more closely with machines and algorithms. Uh, implicit in feedback is knowledge of the system. Feedback is state and status. Feedback of information allows for correction and guidance. State and status becomes assessment and response. An example of this is uh, autopilot in airplanes or the uh, content recommendation algorithms in Facebook. Uh, one of these keeps us safe from change, uh, another keeps us ignorant of diversity. Uh, guidance becomes governance both in embedded systems and in human behavior. Uh, algorithmic, uh, algorithmic guidance is the Prius dashboard that tells you your fuel efficiency. Uh, embedded governance is a bottle of Valium that won't open because you've exceeded your weekly allowance. Cybernetic control is greatly enabled by shared network computation, mediating our interactions, regulating our structures, and guiding our vehicles and devices. Uh, and slowly, it's being uh, invited into our bodies as well. Uh, and really, by inviting algorithms to help us, we enable them to contain us. And this is a very delicate path to tread and something we should bear in mind. So, now, the balance to cybernetic governance may lie in program serendipity, uh, digital artistic license, 
or simply a, a momentary freedom enabled by a sudden glitch in the algorithm. Uh, in articulating the new aesthetic, uh, Bruce Sterling considered the movement as arising from an interruption of the digital into the physical. Uh, the domain of aesthetics is the emotional engagement we have with this eruption. Screens, annotations, and overlays, uh, a blending of layers, a growing inability to differentiate between synthetic and authentic. Uh, polysocial reality, as articulated by Sally Applin and Michael Fisher, uh, how society is modulated by our technologies and how multiplex channels of experience reform relationships and their contexts. Uh, the brain evolved to handle one construct of reality, uh, and we now overlay local and remote experiences simultaneously, uh, and this is really an entirely new cognitive map for us. Uh, and, and in some ways, the psychological exploration of this territory reveals itself through our artistic expressions. Uh, telepresence, data compression, machine vision, reality capture, glitch media, uh, a sort of cyborg aesthetics emerges to communicate the emotionality of and the interaction with this interface between humanity and technology. These are the new artifacts of, of this sort of new aesthetic precipitating from the eruption of the digital into the physical. Uh, the great work of art and science communicates the, cent the centrality of humanity uh, within these domains. Yet human perception, cognition, and expression are all modulated by this ingression of virtuality into our lives. The sort of quickening emergence of ubiquitous computation, polysocial reality, non-local cognition, it, it alters the way we experience the world around us, uh, the way we connect with others, and the way we construct our sense of self. Uh, and while we must be very careful when we abdicate responsibility, uh, to mechanize objects and, and, and embedded governance, uh, the living city offers uh, tremendous opportunities for novelty, innovation, empowerment, uh, and ultimately a deep expression of humanity. Uh, and uh, kind of kind of leave with this quote, the more things change, the more they stay the same, often attributed to Snake Pl Plissken, uh, but probably Alphonse Carr. Um, but this is an important refrain to bear in mind. Um, Underneath all the shiny new things, we're still basically playing the same games. Uh, we're really just sort of young apes not far from the plains of the savanna, looking for a little bit of peace uh, amidst the, the waking of this new dawn. So, thank you. Okay, so I have a, a question, Chris. Um, with the idea of a living city and all the systems uh, that are involved in, a, in, in that, um, who do you feel right now is kind of the closest to having the right idea? I mean, you kind of mentioned uh, some of the players in the space and, and, and things like that uh, briefly, but I know that, for example, like, you know, you have Intel and a lot of others that are trying to go toward uh, the smart city. Even Autodesk had an initiative, so just uh, any input on yeah, um, well, it's, a, it's an interesting question because there's kind of, um, there's a couple different approaches to that. There's the, the top-down, uh, large enterprise-scale solutions like, uh, you know, Smarter Planet and Cisco's uh, offering. Uh, and those are very expensive. They come with uh, really uh, deep licensing challenges for municipalities. Uh, and they also lock municipalities into essentially the profit margins of the parent corporation. So, so cities are hesitant to hitch to that model uh, when the prices could jack up or they could shelve it because it's no longer profitable. Um, so there's uh, kind of the, the other end is sort of the, the bottom up uh, pathway, which I, I tend to think is the more likely pathway because it's less encumbered. Um, and uh, people like Adam Greenfield with Everywhere are doing really interesting stuff in this space. Um, uh, folks like Berg of London are starting to play around in this space. Uh, and, and frankly, I, I think it's more likely, again, I, I tend to side with this bottom-up patchwork approach, that the, the enterprise solutions are valuable and, and will provide um, a sort of uh, proof of concept for the larger implementations, but that ultimately it'll be up to, to cities and to uh, uh, tech clusters to figure out what some of the open source solutions might be. 
any other questions? All right, well, um, we our, our, our last speaker actually has not made it. I guess reality got to them. Um, <laughs> so uh, if, if uh, anyone has any questions for both uh, speakers, then we'll kind of open it up to kind of a panel discussion. Um, or if not, uh, then use this opportunity to uh, restroom, check out the exhibit hall, and everything else. Oh, we have a question. Um, I have a question in this talk. You seem to do a very comprehensive survey of utility um, in the city. It seems to have an expanding utility, and you mentioned aesthetics. I'm wondering what directions for improvement of the aesthetics and living of the city is there embedded in this? Um, yeah, that's an that's a interesting question. Um, so the, the approach I kind of took with this talk uh, w was very tech heavy and, and sort of assumes uh, an increasing uh, kind of malleability, if you will, of the built environment. Uh, so, you know, if there are huge programmable surfaces, for, for example, uh, that are interactive as well, there was a um, a, a really interesting uh, piece that was done at the uh, Spanish, uh, the Barcelona Biennial, uh, Biennial, rather, Biennale, I think is how they pronounce it, uh, where they did a very large screen in a public area, and it was a telepresence screen connected to, I think, a sister city at the time. Uh, and you had this really interesting co-location uh, that was um, uh, presented to the city, where people could come up and interact with the other side of the planet in, in the sort of real time. Uh, so that's, I'm not sure if that's really getting at your question, but the, the technology certainly portends to enable a whole lot of new ways to um, express uh, aesthetics. Now, you could take it in a completely different direction, which is, uh, you know, programmable microbiology that is scrubbing the filth off the walls of the city and, and, and approaching what the sort of status quo aesthetic is, is looking for. Um, so. Then, of course, there's the augmented reality aesthetic, which is how do you uh, publish to that layer and how do you screen out all of the other competing layers? Yeah. Uh, yes, well, since we have a moment, you're talking about the philosophical kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, subjects here. What, what, how do you think that the, uh, the Kurzweil uh, uh, technological singularity uh, plays into the, the mix of topics that you've been talking about? Um, I'm fairly agnostic on that particular religion. Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, you can certainly go science fiction with it and imagine the artificial intelligence that takes control of the, you know, city energy grid and starts talking to us through our cell phones or our programmable walls or what have you. Um, I think the, the utility, the, the development pathways of all of these little components are certainly tending towards more uh, algorithmic capacity, more sensing uh, and more uh, understanding, if you will, of uh, the type of information that they're, they're coming into contact with. So yes, there's certainly a, a, a scenario where all of these little dabblings in, in computational intelligence and sense, sensing uh, may enable a host of more advanced uh, artificial intelligence agents out of that. Uh, and who knows, those may then interface with us in some ways through, through our city, this sort of winter mute, you know, a neuromancer scenario where uh, artificial intelligences are, you know, talking to us over coffee or something. So. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think in some ways we're starting to see that, where you have the sort of Facebook backlashes, you know, where people are, are kind of realizing that the, the information they put out into the world has uh, longevity and duration and is, is available to, to many other parties. Um, 
something with augmented reality. I think it was in the, the crime and AR session. Uh, they talked about uh, one of the one of the speakers mentioned that uh, if suddenly uh, all of our personal data is surfaced into a visual layer, uh, we might be forced to come into um, you know greater comprehension with that and realize, wow, there's actually somebody can completely profile me and understand and even predict what I'm going to do, uh, and that but through that that um, relationship and awareness of that, we might then become more private. Uh, so. I think it's it's really fascinating. I mean, one of the things that I, I would anticipate is that you have these sort of balkanized realities, that, that you have um, social groups and cliques that kind of fragment around um, specific experiences, uh, whether that's, you know, you all wear the avatar of your Warcraft clan, and when you go out into public spaces, you actually see everybody through some augmented, you know, relationship. Or uh, on the other end of the scale is sort of dark nets, like social dark nets that enable, um, um, uh, you know, groups to interface in their own sort of private uh, reality layer, or their pri private social uh, communication structure that can then enable them to have a different view of the world than um, those around them. So I don't know if that really answered your question, but I don't know. Um, real quick question for you, Jim. Uh, with uh, crowd optic. Um, how are you uh, engaging the people who are using the app and, and forming these communities around a particular view after the event? Is, is there, so if I'm, if we're all shooting this and then we're all making comments on it, how, how do you kind of continue the dialogue of the social interaction? Yeah, it, it would be uh, through, through the app that we, um, that we connected our technology to. Uh, as an example, uh, Infineon, um, is a part of a eight racetracks, um, so it's a single app that, with modifications, that uh, we hope to build out. So we we haven't launched with Infineon yet, but we have better statistics for uh, Texas Motor Speedway. So they had 40,000 40, people have the app, and um, and then uh, it was for the race, and then uh, 23,000 of those basically maintain the app so that they can get updates. And so that's how I, I think is, that's why our model I think really uh, is better if we bolt on, we call it, to an app that's out there and where they focused on, on new information and, and essentially allow us to really concentrate on the analytics. So uh, that's how I see it uh, happening you know, over time is, is uh, really through a partnered approach um, We haven't done a lot uh, in that regard yet. Um, and uh, in terms of the reference to the app, I mean, yeah, I, I'll have to catch myself. Uh, it is our app, but, but with Infineon, for example, it could be downloaded from, from their website. We're kind of really focusing on, uh, because they have much better, you know, NASCAR's got better re recognition than us. But that would be the next level, is essentially to go out. Uh, and right now it's one way, we push out uh, to Facebook and Twitter and uh, to see whether we can make that a two-way communication is something that's probably next for us to do. Yeah. Okay, well, if no more questions, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.